And here we go at Psalms 100. I believe we need to pick up at verse 3. Thank you for joining me. It's always a pleasure. Know ye that the Lord, He is God. It is He who has made us, and not we ourselves. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Notes. Uh, quite a few things are said here in this verse. Number one is that Jesus Christ is God, not Buddha, Muhammad, and Vishnu, or Osiris, or any of those. We are the product of His hand and not a product of senseless, mindless evolution. Um, he saved us. We could not save ourselves. And we are His people. And number five, we will forage in His pasture. And what a pasture it will be. We're only getting very, very small taste of His blessings right now. The true victory comes to us whenever we die and we are His. Verse 4, Enter into His gates with thanksgiving and into His courts with praise. Be thankful unto Him and bless His name. Notes. Now, even though this verse refers to the old economy of God, in essence it means that every believer, when coming into the Lord's presence in prayer, should begin with thanksgiving and praise. You know, that should be the hallmark of Christianity towards God. Verse 5. For the Lord is good, His mercy is everlasting, and His truth endures to all generations. Notes. Everything else falls by the wayside while His truth marches on and does so forever. Heaven and earth will pass away from one condition to another, but these words in this book, in the original Hebrew text and Greek and whatnot, they're still going to be there. They're still going to be having the same exact effect as they have for all these centuries. They are unchanging. Chapter 101. I will sing of mercy and judgment unto you, O Lord, will I sing. Notes. Well, this psalm right here portrays the character and capacity of the king to whom it is to be given the kingdom. This psalm, plus several which will follow, show how Christ was to be tested by suffering, whether personal or otherwise. And David, who wrote this psalm, and was a typology of him, was also tested with quite a bit of suffering. His personal perfection is the subject of the first three verses. Or no, first two verses. And, of course, we're talking of Christ. Verse 2. I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. Oh, when will you come unto me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. Notes. Now, when we're talking about the expression, behave myself wisely... Uh, it was said of David several times while he was with Saul, and when Saul was attempting to kill him, he did so several times. Uh, you can find it in First Samuel chapter 18, verse 5, and a couple of verses down from that. As well, the greater son of David behaved himself very wisely. David's way was not perfect. However, the way of the son of man was a perfect way because he had a perfect heart. He didn't have any transgressions or any uh, any kind of sin within him. And that alone made him stand out from the crowd right there. David could only desire these things. Well, Christ was these things. And thus we have one of the major differences right there. David simply being a typology of the greater thing to come. Verse 3, I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. I hate the work of them who turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. Notes. Now, this isn't indicative of David's character, but this was the heart of David, uh, although it didn't always come out in his actions. He wanted to serve God in truth and perfection and whatnot, but, uh, but he falls into the same category as Paul the Apostle, who was one of the most brilliant writers in ancient history. And you can find what I'm talking about in Romans chapter 7, verse 15. No matter how good you try to be, uh, you're still going to have sin in your life, no matter how hard you try, as long as you're here on the earth. But anyways, the turning aside has to do with uh, deviating from the Word of God. Uh, like the Sadducees, they denied the Word of God, and the Pharisees twisted the Word of God, and in many cases they added to it. And Christ said that he hated their works. Well, the Sadducees, they didn't believe in any kind of resurrection, and the Pharisees, they... Uh, 
they put more emphasis on rituals than they did righteousness, uh, such as that case where uh, the disciples are out in the field and they refuse to wash their hands before they eat. And, oh, they just got so defiled. Uh, that was ridiculous. Okay, I, I can't t I can't think of the exact verse, but you can probably find the story very easily yourself. With that being said, verse four: A froward heart shall depart from me. I will not know a wicked person. Notes. Now this word froward means perverse or wicked. Okay. Now the sense of this verse is that Christ would never agree to or place approval upon the perverseness of the scribes, the Sadducees, and Pharisees. They were classified as wicked people. And look no further than the stories about them in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the Acts and what not, just to find out what kind of wonderful people they really were. Now there were a few of them that wisened up, but sadly not many of them. Okay, Simon was one of them, if I remember correctly. With that being said, verse 5. Whoso privily slanders his neighbor, him will I cut off. Him who has a high look and a proud heart, will not I suffer. Notes. In general, this does apply to anyone. However, its greater fulfillment pertains to the action of the scribes, Pharisees, and Sadducees, who are always slandering Christ and always trying to uh, trick him into something. They left some of their ancient writings and... Uh, they said quite a few really nasty things about him. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to get into that, but uh, you can definitely see that the Bible bears out what they really thought of him, the very Son of God, trying to save them. Verse 6, My eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land, that they may dwell with me. He who walks in a perfect way, he shall serve me. Notes. Well, Christ here says that he would put his eyes upon the faithful of the land instead of upon the ruling religious hierarchy, or hierarchy, I should say. If all you've got is a bunch of religious nonsense, that's just what it really is, a bunch of nonsense. Verse 7, He who works deceit shall not dwell within my house. He who tells lies shall not tarry in my sight. Notes. Now, regrettably, most organized religion works from a foundation of deceit. And as the leader, Satan, it functions by telling lies, or half-truths. Uh, those are some of the most dangerous lies. Verse 8, I will utterly destroy all the wicked of the land, that I may cut off all the wicked doers from the city of the Lord. Notes. Now, that should ring a little bit of a bell right there if you've been listening to my teachings before. At the beginning of the millennial reign, Christ will put down the wicked of the land. Right then and right there. He will rule with a rod of iron, and like I've said before, it doesn't mean that he's going to be an evil dictator or anything like that, but what he says is what's going to end up happening. He's going to be unquestionably the one in charge. Psalm 102 now. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and let my cry come unto you. Notes. Well, now we have two subjects that are going to be covered in this particular psalm. The, glory, the glories of Christ as the great king are contrasted with his sufferings at the, as the rejected human. Here, as in so many other scriptures, his sufferings and glories are brought together, and always in that order. I find that kind of unusual. It was necessary that he should be both the man of sorrows and the mighty God at the same time, because as the one, he is equipped with mercy, and as the other, he's got quite a bit of firepower when it comes to judgment. He is the afflicted one in this psalm. We'll read about him more in the second one. Anyways, verse 2, Hide not your face from me in the day when I am in trouble, and incline your ear unto me. In the day... When I call, answer me speedily. Notes. Now, both verses 1 and 2 pertain to Christ as very man. He was every bit as human as we are, although he never ceased at being very much a God. Yet he was also a perfect sacrifice, and thankful we should be for that. What an unusual loving God we serve. Verse 3. 
For my days are consumed like smoke, and my bones are burned as an hearth. Notes. The sufferings he endured from the opposition of virtually all of Israel and the religious hierarchy, it literally consumed him day by day. Verse 4. My heart is smitten and withered like grass so that I forget to eat my bread. Notes. Now, as Christ was dealing with a lost world, broken-hearted over its destitute spiritual condition, it says of him, in the meanwhile his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. You, you can look at that in John chapter 4, verse 31. This seems to indicate to me that Jesus did a lot of fasting and a lot of praying concerning the condition of this world for people to wake up to his reality. Verse 5. By reason of the voice of my groaning, my bones cleave to my skin. Notes. This passage right here tells us that his earthly ministry was filled with such consternation because of the terrible sin of his people, especially the religious leaders. I mean, they wanted to kill him almost immediately. But, like a trooper and a true trooper that he actually is, he preached in the synagogue until they actually had to just remove him from it. Anyways, verse 6. I am like a pelican of the wilderness. I am like an owl of the desert. Notes. Now, both the pelican and the owl were unclean fowls and thereby unacceptable. Well, Christ is saying that he was treated by the religious hierarchy like an unclean bird. Uh, something to be avoided at all cost. Well, uh, it just shows you their level of ignorance right there. Verse 7. I watch and am as a sparrow alone upon the house top. Notes. Now, sparrows have some interesting behavior patterns. A sparrow was seldom alone unless its mate was killed. There was no one who could enter into the sufferings of Christ, and for pretty much all the obvious reasons. I mean, I don't think anyone would ever even attempt to do something that ridiculous. He was truly God. Verse 8. My enemies reproach me all the day long, and they who are mad against me are sworn against me. Notes. Now the scribes and Pharisees, as is evident from this verse, bound themselves by an oath to destroy him. As a matter of fact, they said that they would not eat bread until they had finally got him right where they wanted him. Verse 9. For I have eaten ashes like bread, and mingled my drink with weeping. Notes. Well, the great sorrows of our Lord Christ was twofold. Number one, Israel's rejection of him, and that was really, really rough on him. But number two, what it would mean to them. Okay. Verse 10. Because of your indignation and your wrath, for you have lifted me up and cast me down. Notes. On the Mount of Transfiguration, he was lifted up, for the voice said, This is my beloved Son. And on the Mount of Condemnation, uh, which would be Calvary, he was cast down, and he cried, Why have you forsaken me? Verse 11. My days are like a shadow that declines, and I am withered like grass. Notes. He didn't come here to live a happy life. His sole purpose on this earth was to come and die. But in his death, he bought eternal life for untold millions of people. Verse 12. But you, O Lord, shall endure forever, and your remembrance unto all generations. Notes. Now, verses 1 through 11 speak of his first advent. Uh, these next couple of verses, verses 12 through about 22, speak of his second advent. As the first was in suffering and sorrow, the second shall be in glory and great victory. And we will cover that in the next teaching at Psalms chapter 102, verse 13. Thank you, and God bless. Bye-bye.